Morning, or welcome again to the online service of Warrigal Church of Christ. I'm Chris Rowney, the team leader here. And if you're new, we hope that today will be enriching and rewarding. If you've been with us before, or you're one of our regulars, great to have you again. It's also great that we've been hearing from different ones of you, ways that you've been touched and encouraged, and just that we're still reaching you at this time. If you want to be in touch, the church's email address will be on the screen at some stage during the service this morning and again at the end. I'm going to be sharing a bit later on the topic of what's in a name as we continue to look at the Great Commission. There'll be something for the kids, there'll be a mission spot, and also someone will lead us in a time of communion. But let me pray and then we'll begin to worship in song. Heavenly Father, this is the day in which we remember fatherhood here in Australia. But Lord, we thank you that you are the one who is the greatest model of that for us. We thank you for your unconditional love, for your acceptance of us, for the way that you challenge us, encourage us, and give us the um, safe uh, grounding from which to explore this life that you have blessed us with. Might we bring to you today the needs that we know we have, but also might we be met in those deep parts of our spirit where there are needs that we might not even be aware of, but that you as the one who sings over us as a loving dad would be the one who wants to release us, set us free. In Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness. Amen. Oh
Hey kids, happy Father's Day to your dads. Today is obviously Father's Day, a day where we honour dads and think about what their impact is on us and our lives. I think dads are pretty important. I'm kind of biased, I'm a dad, but I think dads are pretty important. How do you feel when you think about your dad? A lot of us feel grateful and pretty happy when we think about our dads. Maybe your dad is very funny or or maybe your dad thinks he's very funny but he's not quite as funny as he thinks. Well a lot of people today on Father's Day are feeling a bit sad. I think there's a lot of people who can't spend Father's Day with their with their dads for a lot of reasons and especially at the moment with all the restrictions that are in place we can't celebrate Father's Day often in the way that we normally would in a family gathering or something like that. And that's, that can be a bit sad. But I've come up with a couple of things, three things that we can do on Father's Day for free right here today with very little preparation that we could do for our dad. So that's exciting. I'm letting you off the hook if you haven't already made him breakfast in, in bed, which I'm sure you did. <laughs> 
Um, so for starters, there's something we can do. You and me, we can do that right now together. What we'll do is we'll close our eyes. We'll close our eyes and we'll think about something about our dad that we're, we're grateful for. You ready? So we'll do that now. Mm, something about your dad. Maybe you find it a bit tricky. <laughs> you know, when I think about my dad, I'm really grateful. But my dad, he always makes time to listen to me. And he loves to watch movies with me. That's something I'm really grateful for. Did you think of something about your dad that you're grateful for that makes you say thanks in your heart? Maybe your dad's really funny. Or maybe your dad looks after you. Maybe your dad is very clever and he teaches you things. Maybe your dad gives the best big bear hugs. Or maybe you got your good looks from your dad. <laughs> well, that's the first thing of the three things that I think we could do today. Maybe, even if it's by message, you can let your dad know something that you're grateful for about him. You know, you wouldn't be here without your dad. And that's enough for me to be very grateful for your dad. The second thing that we can do for our dads is maybe we can encourage them. Maybe that's about something they've done, but you can always encourage your dad, maybe by letting them know that God loves them. And the third thing that we can all do for our dads is we can talk to God, our father, about our dads and pray for our dads. God is the great father. He's the one who wrote the book on fatherhood and how to be a good father. And there's lots in the Bible about fathers and about the importance of fatherhood. I think that's maybe the most important one to be praying for your dad and about your dad. That's something you might like to do when you're on your own. But for now, why don't we pray together? Thank you, God, for dads. Thank you that you're the one who invented dads with a very specific purpose. Thank you for all the good things that dads are made to do. Thank you for our dads. None of us are perfect. We all fall short. I pray that you would show your grace to them and that you'd show us how we can encourage and support our dads to keep becoming the men that you made them to be. Thank you, God, that you are our good and perfect, compassionate and loving father and that we can talk to you whenever we want and receive your love and grace and truth. Amen. Happy Father's Day.
on this lovely spring Sunday morning. Uh, it's great to see you and I'd like to share a bit about what's happening with our uh, mission partners. First off, uh, Safe Water September, good on you those people that are drinking water for this month and getting people to sponsor them to drink only water. Uh, so if you're one of those people, uh, I would love to sponsor you. So if you send me an email or a text or phone me, let me know and I'd like to sponsor you. The other things with Christmas child boxes, uh, thanks to Brendan for sharing about those last week. I've actually got 12 boxes uh, left over from last year, empty boxes. So if you'd like one, uh, if you send me a message and I'll uh, get that to you. So that'd be great. And today our focus is on Bangladesh and Indonesia. So uh, just our update from uh, Vanna Baum, the General Secretary of uh, Bandaman Hills Church of Christ in Bangladesh, is that uh, they were in lockdown for four months and had a, a curfew on transportation. And that's actually now been lifted. It's not because there is uh, less coronavirus, but many people uh, had no food. Um, at that time and so they've lifted it because of that but uh, so we need to uh, keep them in our prayers and also uh, just to say that they wrote that they're praying for us they are in prayer praying and fasting for us in Australia and that uh, really encouraged and challenged me that uh, we can be doing the same for them with the uh, hostel situation there, as uh, has been reported before, they've decided to uh, build a new hostel out of the flood zone. Uh, but at the moment, they can't get started on that uh, due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, so let's pray for them and for the students there. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are at work and thank you that there've been some baptisms in um, Bandaman Hills that your spirit is not limited by a pandemic and we thank you for that we pray for the students who uh, have not been at school for uh, over four months because of the pandemic and we pray for their education and we pray uh, that the things will be able to get set in place for building the new hostels and we pray these things in your name Amen uh, in Indonesia the um, uh, our partners there report that they're doing really well uh, despite the uh, restrictions that there are and they've uh, moved, this is the theological colleges there, have uh, moved much more to remote learning and they're also getting an upgrade of their internet uh, and a well and a baptismal font being built there uh, at the moment. So uh, let's pray for our partners in Indonesia. Heavenly Father, we're excited to hear about the fruit that's uh, a result of the students going out throughout uh, Indonesia and sharing uh, your word. Thank you for the training that they're receiving. Thank you that uh, the college can get an upgrade in internet so that the remote learning can really happen effectively. So we pray for them at this time that they would be really great witnesses to your love and grace and care. Uh, during this really hard time. So we pray this in Jesus' name. And uh, just to say that our um, mission financial year goes from October to uh, September, so we're nearly at the end of that. And the giving up until the end of August is $9,878. So a little shy of our 12,000 that we need by the end of the month but a great effort given that we haven't actually met together in the last five months or over five months. So if you uh, have got money at home and you were thinking you were gonna put that in when you were back at church, if you could um, go to the bank or internet bank with that, uh, or maybe you've given already, but you uh, would love to give some more to uh, help our partners overseas. So uh, the uh, go to the internet bank or go to the, um, Bendigo Bank or Bank Online and the account details are there and uh, let's see how much we can get by the end of the month. So good things happening in our mission program. Thanks. Daddy, Daddy, can I have an ice cream please? From the time children begin to say Dada or Mama, they start pointing to things 
or peering over the edge of the high chair to see what they just threw on the floor. Ah, ah, they murmur, indicating a request that parents or carers soon find out is never ending. Today is Father's Day 2020 and I wanted to talk to you about when Jesus and also Paul used Abba, the daddy or papa word for God. In ancient times, the Jews never used Abba to talk to God. Ecclesiastes 5.1 showed their mindset. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Jesus used Abba, or Father, in his prayers, showing a close relationship between God and himself, indeed a family relationship. This entirely new and, yes, unheard of use of Abba in prayer showed Jesus' attitude of trust in the Father and his authority from God his Father. Matthew 11.27 tells us, my father has handed over everything to me. In Romans and Galatians, where Paul uses Abba, he may have been thinking of the Lord's Prayer. This means that Jesus' example in the Lord's Prayer of addressing God as his father is one we have authority to follow as Jesus' disciples. Who is allowed to call God Abba or Father? Well, it is the children of God, of course, we who are the sons and daughters. In 2 Corinthians 6, we find, In fact, I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. No matter who your earthly father was or is, the one who gave you blue eyes or brown, the one who fostered or adopted you, one who was absent or died too young. You now have the most wonderful father in all the world. Your heavenly father wants to hear the stories of your day, the requests of your heart, for wisdom, for forgiveness or provision, and to send his Holy Spirit to help you in whatever is needed to grow you to be more like Jesus. Let me pray for us now and then join together in the Lord's Prayer, which reminds us that God is our Father. The words will be on the screen. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you as your children with everything that concerns us, knowing that you care so much. We know this because you sent Jesus to be born to live, to die, and to rise again according to your plan. Nourish us, cleanse us as we eat and drink these emblems now. Amen. Our Father, who is in heaven, honoured be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
I don't know whether you were with us last week, but Josh did a great job of talking about discipleship. And though um, I could perhaps do with the uh, wig prop more than him, I don't have that with me today. But I'm still going to continue to look at the Great Commission. We've started quite a few weeks ago now looking at the Great Commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. And um, now the Great Commission we've been spending a few weeks on as well. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. One of the things mentioned here in this Great Commission is baptizing. Who? Well, them, or the people of all nations. And baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before I go on, just to guess really quickly something about baptism. I mean, it's one of those um, symbols in the church, but it's something that's more than a symbol. It really is an experience and a place to um, receive the grace that God pours upon us and to um, understand and, and participate in that by doing something that we do to acknowledge what Jesus has already done in sense of cleaning us from our sin. Baptism, um, a bath for the dirty, you might want to say. And this verse in Acts, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And of course, as we practice baptism by immersion, there's the symbolism there. And again, the experience, the reality of what Jesus has done in being a burial for the dead and a raising to new life. Um, Colossians, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, um, God made you alive with Christ and he forgave us all of our sins. But this morning, um, I want to really think about what it might mean when it says to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people like to point out that while here in Matthew it says Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in quite a few places in Acts we find the disciples baptizing in the name of Jesus. Here in Acts 2, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And here uh, again in Acts, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And um, one final one again from Acts. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, some people have made a big deal about whether the right words were said at the time of someone's baptizing. Was it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, or was it in the name of Jesus? Um, so some do it in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the name of Jesus, just to be complete. But really, all of that misses the point of what Jesus was really telling his followers here, because it's not a formula for doing baptism as a ceremony correctly. It's not a script to say. Some people have taken this to you know, argue all sorts of things about the nature of God, which I'll perhaps come on to again in just a minute. But here what Jesus is really doing is carrying on from what he said at the beginning of the Great Commission, saying, he came, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. He's talking about authority. And the next phrase that goes on from that, um, baptizing them in the name of, that's again invoking that authority. And that authority, the authority of Father, Son and Spirit, has been given to Jesus, he's claimed, and that's then the authority with which he commissions us and the authority in which we go. And there aren't three competing or even complementary authorities that Jesus talks about here. It's not as if the Father has some authority and the Son has some authority and the Spirit has some authority. The name is singular, not plural. There's one name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And there's one authority that belongs to Father, Son and Spirit together as the one eternal uncreated God. One God in three persons, as we 
say in theological talk. Not three gods in one, just to perhaps foolishly, very briefly talk about the, the Trinity. Um, the Trinity is not three gods in one. And it's also not one God who's just acting in three different ways. It's three in one God. One God, but three persons, as we say, Father, Son and Spirit. And some people that you may have heard of, they sort of get labelled as the oneness Pentecostal group generally, and they'll say that, well, there isn't a Trinity, there is just one God, and really his name now is Jesus. And so that's why baptism in the name of the Father, Son and the Spirit, they say is not right, because the name of the Father, Son and the Spirit is Jesus. Um, I think they misunderstand, but it's kind of understandable because the Trinity is a concept that is for us a mystery. But perhaps we can get our heads around it a little bit. You know, my human being is taken up fully by my one person. We're all like that. And so for us, the idea that you can have more than one person in one being just doesn't make sense. We might talk about someone being two-faced or we might have two minds, just as flippant ways of talking. But we really do understand that we are one person and that completely fills our being. So to have three human persons, we need three human beings. But we're only human beings. God is the divine being, not a human being. And so while still being God, one God can be three persons. Now, don't push any analogy, but one analogy might be to talk about three squares. Think about three dimensions. In, you know, um, a two-dimensional piece of paper, you, you can draw a square. You can draw a second square. You can draw a third square. But they're separate in that many dimensions, if you like, in that sense of being. But, you know, a cube, you can have a whole heap of squares that are each squares, but part of one greater being, the cubeness of it. As I said, don't push any analogy. But remember, don't say that there's three gods in one or one God just acting in three ways. One God in three persons. And part of that is important for us to understand this stuff about the name, because just a little bit of extra theology here is that Jesus is God and man. Where we read here in Colossians, the Son is the image of the invisible God. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. That's interesting because Jesus is the Son of God or the Word of God made incarnate. But that's not just a third of God. Because you can't divide God. Even though the Son is God, the Father is God, and the Spirit are God, and the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son or the Father, you can't take God and divide it up. So when it talks about the fullness of the deity dwelling in Jesus, um, I don't think that means the Father and the Spirit were with the Son incarnate in the man Jesus. It's the Son that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. But the divine Son, while not the Father or the Spirit, is not in any sense just a third of God, the fullness of God. And so Jesus can properly say all authority in heaven and on earth, which belongs properly to God, the name of the Father, Son and the Spirit, has been given to him and he speaks therefore as God for the Father and the Spirit. As is said here, all authority in heaven and on earth. And that's what I think is meant when we get to the idea of the name of, in the authority of. You know, authority is a challenging concept for us. I think that, you know, when we try to grasp what it means, we often confuse it with power. And the definition here in the Oxford English Dictionary starts with this thing of power or right to enforce. And a sad side effect of that, as a friend of mine in the, um, that I met at Bible College uh, says sometimes when we chat, is that sometimes there's a problem in that we think that um, power is being abused when it might just be proper authority being exercised. Now, it's true that in our fallen humanity, we are and we can easily abuse power, but we've forgotten how authority kind of works. 
And we've forgotten, another thing my friend says, is that authority begins where agreement ends. Because if we go along with somebody in authority, as long as we agree with it, well, we're really just doing what we think is right in our own eyes anyway. But where the agreement ends, if we recognize their authority, that's when we will submit to that authority out of humility. Otherwise, we're not recognizing authority and we're just doing what it says in the book of Judges, if you've ever read it, which has this great saying, um, these people did what was right in their own eyes. But anyway, to move on, I think the New Testament makes it clear that the name and the name of Jesus, especially as we read, has authority and is also a source of power. In the book of Acts, Peter and John had healed the lame man and they're brought before the council and they question them and they say, by what power or what name did you do this? They recognize that the idea of the name is really the source of the authority by which they spoke and the power which backed up and demonstrated that authority. If you read the rest of this, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. In other words, in the name of Jesus is the power and authority by which they did this. And just as an aside, may it ever be that if we are called to account, it's because of our acts of kindness. But this name of Jesus we see is used a number of times in the New Testament, both as power and authority. Here in the book of Acts, there's a case where Paul is going around preaching and there's a, a, a woman who's um, a, a fortune teller and uh, demonized, it says, and she has a spirit and just keeps going around and, and, and disrupting what's going on. And she did this for many days and eventually Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to leave her. And it came out at that very moment. Another one here from later in the New Testament, one of the letters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, keep away from those who are idle and disruptive and don't live according to the teachings that you received from us. And in the first, the name of Jesus, um, commanding the spirit to come out, uh, worked in power to see that happen. Perhaps here in this other one, whether the command in the name of Jesus force the Thessalonians to obey what Paul had said, or whether even though he's speaking with authority, their wills may have um, come against that. It's still an authoritative statement because he's done it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he hasn't just said whatever he wants and tacked in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on as if that's a stamp to rubber stamp what Paul wants to say. No, he's speaking and saying and teaching the things that he received himself from Jesus. You know, one day I'll probably speak again about the appropriate way to exercise authority, even the power of Jesus' name, by which we're commissioned in this great commission in Matthew's Gospel. But what I found myself asking myself as I prayed and prepared this week's message is really this. If I've been baptised in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I have been, if I've been forgiven and justified in the name of Jesus, and as it says here in Acts 6, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. If those things are true and they are, in a very real sense, my life is now lived in his name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, am I making his name great? Or am I bringing his name into disrepute? Or am I just trying to make a name for myself? You know, Colossians 3.17 is always a great verse to keep in mind. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, without meaning to, a song from my younger days came bubbling in my spirit as I was preparing this week. And you might know it as well. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. 
And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love, as he told me to. He said, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. All power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his power as he told me to. And it goes on with another verse about sharing his peace in the name of Jesus. You know, it might seem like a cute play on words to have asked, as I did a little while ago, are we just making a name for ourselves? But it is a real danger we could do well to avoid. The story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Um, the people of the earth said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. And so there was the scattering of the people. I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but again and again, the sin which provokes God into action against people, against us, either starts in or ends in pride. Adam and Eve. Babel here, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, I could go on. And the reason I think that the idea of making a name for themselves is a problem is because really we're to live in the name of the one who created us, who made us, who called us, who saved us. And God's jealous of his name. In Exodus, we read this, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Now, that doesn't just mean that you know, God feels envious of the you know, uh, praise or affection that you might give to another. He guards, jealously guarding his name because of the precious nature of it and the worth of it. Sometimes we treat the second commandment in Exodus, I think, you know, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain, as if it's primarily an injunction against bad language or swearing, but as much as anything, I think it's a warning that as his people, we represent him to the world, and so how we live is a reflection on his name, and that as we do things, um, they're to bring glory to his name. In the New Testament, the words of the Lord's Prayer begin, Hallowed be your name, holy is your name. And again, I think we treat his name as holy best, not by just saying it with reverence or not using it as a swear word or a curse word, but by reflecting in our lives the truth and purity of his name. As we go in the words of the song, which I'll come back to, in his name, doing these things, if we do anything else, people can look at that and think that's also done in his name. We talk about it sometimes, don't we? The horrors of the world, wars and slavery, perhaps done by some people in, in God's name. And, and we recoil at that because it reflects badly on the truth of who God is. And so how we live reflects on God's name. And that is why God is jealous of his name. You know, the way we approach authority properly, the way we approach the one in whose name we do things, is with an appropriate measure of humility and a recognition that God, the one in whom this authority rests, is kind and compassionate. And so do we live in a way that reflects that, humbly acknowledging his goodness, his kindness, his compassion, Again from Exodus, the Lord said to Moses here, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. This can seem disjointed. God's going to pass goodness in front of Moses and then he's going to say his name, proclaim his name loudly and clearly. And then he goes on to talk about mercy and compassion. But it's not disjointed. It goes together. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name. You know, I'm not even sure that those are two separate things. Perhaps the goodness that passes in front of Moses is the proclamation of the name of the Lord. 
perhaps him going on to talk about mercy and compassion, again, are because they reflect and are deeply embedded in the name of the Lord. You know, as we live and act, what kind of name are we making for God? Are we glorifying his name? The good, the merciful, the compassionate. The name in which we love, in which we act, in which we pray. It says here in the Psalms, you know, I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. Now, I don't think we bring glory and make God any more glorious than he is by singing um, songs about him. But we bring glory to his name when we live in a way that causes others to also praise him for his goodness. Again, here in John's Gospel, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, glorify your name. And then it says a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. I think one of the ways he's glorified it is in the life that Jesus lived. In the name of his Father. In his name. And the things he then commands us to do in that same name are the things to bring glory to God. As I said about these words of the Great Commission, I don't think baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is a script, a set of words to be spoken at a ceremony of baptism. But it's a truth about who we now belong to. In fact, there's some argument that here really kind of says baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And it's a word and a concept that's to do with um, you know, banking and, and depositing something into someone's account. So if we're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, we're now deposited into them. We belong to them. And so now the things that we do, we do as change in their pockets. There's a great saying that John Wimber um, once said that we're just changing God's pocket for him to spend as he wishes. It doesn't kind of diminish us as being, you know, worthless to God, but, you know, we belong to him and how he uses us reflects who he is. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit um, is not a script for baptism, but it's a reminder of who we represent as we go into the world making disciples. You know, the reality is that our lives as baptized believers, as disciples, as followers of Jesus, are lived in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, a few weeks ago, looking at the new commandment, we saw that Jesus urged us to love one another because it was by that love that people would know we were his disciples. And as he loved us, so we are to love others. You know, and in a sense, we represent him to the world. All authority is his, and he then authorizes us to be his representatives. As he has loved us, we now go and love one another in his name. And as we do that, people will know that we are his disciples. We shouldn't need to put, you know, a fish on our car or a badge on our you know, front that indicates that we're Christians. Perhaps if they know that we're Christians by our love, it's because they'll know that we represent the name of Jesus well. So we're commissioned in his name, in this great commission, to teach, to make disciples and to baptise. The chorus, the refrain from the song, Freely, Freely, pretty much covers the new commandments, just with some different words. Um, freely, freely you have received, as I have loved you. Freely, freely give, so you should love one another. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. And by this shall everyone know that you are my disciples. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. Baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
things done in the name of Jesus. It's not just different words to use in a ceremony. They all remind us we're his. In his name, we now go and do his things to his people and those that he longs to bring into his family. So whatever you do this week, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Know that it's done in the name of the Lord Jesus, whatever it is you're doing. Know that it's in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so might that shape give you pause before some things you do, energize with greater passion some of the things that you do. And might it be true to say that because of how we go about in his name, how we love one another, that others will know that he lives and we would see more become disciples, making more disciples. Amen. Forgive my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name. See